Hello and welcome to the Soul Sync podcast. I'm Jason Paul. How are you? I hope you're keeping well. Now, first of all, you're probably going to notice that my voice is two octaves lower than normal. I have had over the last uh, couple of weeks the most sore throat and just felt really under the weather, which is why I haven't released an episode for a couple of weeks because I can barely even talk. Um, It's actually led me on an exploration to look at my throat chakra because I must admit, I doing the soul sync and being on the spiritual journey that I'm on, obviously I am aware of the chakras, but I haven't done a load of work with them. So having this sore throat, a friend of mine actually mentioned to me, um, just in passing, you know, like a friend does, not really thinking about it, and said, oh, have you looked at your throat chakra? Um, You need to have blue and turquoise, which led me to go and read one of the books that I've got about chakras, because I've got a lot of different books that I've bought over the years, and I've only read a very small percentage of them, so much so that I've actually got a book embargo now. I am not buying any more books until I've read the books that I've got. And it's really made me realise but actually, I do think <clears throat> there is a lot of truth in the symptoms that I've got, um, which align with that of the throat chakra and the throat chakra being out of balance. So over on my YouTube channel, I'm going to be talking a lot more about the chakras and my journey with them and my understanding of them and actually how I'm going about trying to heal myself um, from within. So that's a little bit about how I've been. I'm really excited to bring today's uh, guest to you because... It really touched my heart because um, the guest we've got is called Julie McFadden and she is known on TikTok, um, known to millions on TikTok even, as Hospice Nurse Julie. And I've had my fair share of experiences of hospices uh, because both my nan and granddad sadly passed away in one. And Julie came on to talk about um, her 15 years as a hospice nurse. Um, and her experiences and also um, normalising the conversation around death. So I think you're going to enjoy today's episode and it it really opened my eyes and touched my heart in a lot of different ways. So without further ado, I welcome onto the Soul Sync this week, Julie McFadden. Um, Her journey as a hospice nurse began in ICU where she witnessed firsthand the profound impact that compassionate end-of-life care can have on patients and their families. Now, her experiences in the hospital setting led to her to specialise in hospice care, where she found her calling in guiding patients through their final days with dignity and comfort. Now, like I said, she is known to millions on TikTok as Hospice Nurse Julie, and she's cultivated a vast online uh, community dedicated to fostering open conversations about death and demystifying the fears that surround it. Now, with over 3 million followers across social media platforms, Julie has become a trusted voice in the realms of of end-of-life care, offering solace and support to individuals facing the complexities of mortality. Now, in a groundbreaking book, Nothing to Fear, Demystifying Death to Live More Fully, Julie distills her years of experience into a comprehensive guide that challenges society's perceptions of both death and dying. Through a blend of personal anecdotes, professional insights and practical advice, Julie empowers the readers to embrace the inevitability of death and live each day with intention and purpose. So I hope you enjoy this week's episode. So, Julie, firstly, a massive warm welcome onto the Soul Sync podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's great to meet you, finally. It is. Now, I've been... Um, can you hear me okay? Oh. Oh, we lost each other. Jason. Oh, we've frozen a bit. We have. Uh-oh. Let me start that again. Yeah. Can you hear okay. me okay now? I can, yes. Okay, can let you... me start again. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. If it, if this proves problematic, we will switch back to Zoom, but let's just go again. So Julie, firstly, a massive warm welcome onto the Soul Sync podcast. Thank you. So nice to be here. So I firstly have been so excited to talk to you because there is so much I want to ask you and talk through. Um, obviously, I've just briefly introduced you introduction uh, in the introduction, but let, can you just tell um, me and the guests a bit about you firstly and how you got into the line of work that it is that you do? Yes. So I've been a nurse um, for 16 years. 
And I was an ICU nurse, which if anyone who, it doesn't work in the medical field, that's an intensive care unit nurse, just, just, just means like a higher acuity of patients. So people are, many people are dying in the ICU, not always, but many people are. So we're trying to keep them from dying, which is good. <laughs> There's always a place for that, of course. And um, I did that for many years. And through that experience, I was like, okay, we're all going to die. All of us. Uh, unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know. So, and I don't like how people are dying in the ICU. I don't like this. This is, we're not, we're not educating people enough. We're not telling them soon enough. I want to do something different. And through that experience is what kind of led me into hospice nursing. And it wasn't anything really profound. It was more just like, a, I'm just going to try it because I was so miserable as an ICU nurse. And that was eight years ago. So um, eight years ago, I started hospice nursing. It took me about a year to be like, whoa, this is crazy. Because <laughs> our bodies are crazy in the sense of mm. like, they're built to die. Like all these things I kept seeing. And then about three years ago is when I got onto social media, which was very random because of my nieces, because they were little teenagers and they were on TikTok and they were showing me TikTok. And that is how I got onto TikTok. And then this whole thing, like truly this whole educating online about death and dying feels like it kind of just took on a life of its own. And here I am with you. <laughs> well, it, it, it's crazy as well, because you... you you know, you haven't got a small following on these um, platforms. It's an absolutely massive following, you know, on TikTok, 1.4 million, which I guess begs the question, um, I, you know, there, there isn't, you never really see anything on social media about dying. And we don't talk about it. It's very taboo. And even myself, um, how I got onto this journey myself was me and my mum, well, she brought up on a holiday one day, about the subject of death. And I said, mum, 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 I don't want to talk about it. I don't like it. I don't want to think about it. And I think so many of us are like that. Yeah. So how have you found the experience of being on social media and talking about a subject that is so um, not talked about, really? What's your experiences of being the advocate for talking about all things death? So th this whole thing has been a very big surprise because just like you in my everyday life, I always say if I'm at a dinner party or something and people ask what I do, and then I say I'm a hospice nurse, <laughs> I never am like, no one's ever like, tell me more. Everyone is like, yikes. I don't, I don't, and that's all they'll say interesting. Or they'll go, oh God, that must be depressing. And then, then topic dropped because no one wants to talk about it. And then I come onto social media and my like fourth video in went viral and then they kept going viral and it made me think people must want to learn about this, but maybe there's something with like social media that kind of keeps it a little separate. So it's like, it's mm -hmm. not so in their face or something because I don't know. It uh, it's feel to me it's been a good experience. Like to me I get mostly nice people, mostly every once in a while someone's not nice. But mostly nice people and mostly people willing to want to learn. So it's been great and I'm excited that the world seems to be opening up a little bit about wanting mm. to educate themselves about death and dying. So mm, so Talking about your work in the hospice, because you are very close to death every single day. How has that firstly shaped your view about death? Well, how do you feel about death now being so close to it every day? So, like I said before, it took me like a, a year into being a hospice nurse where I was seeing it kind of over and over, like what the natural process of death was, meaning someone's dying from some disease, but we're allowing the natural process of death to take over. And watching that over and over again for like a year made me be like, blew my mind because I couldn't believe how well our bodies were built to really help us die. And that, that in itself, just the biological part of how our bodies are built to die has helped, has helped decrease my fear. 
because everyone has fear around death. It's like mm. the unknown, you know? So my fear around death and dying and the fact that we are truly physically and biologically built to do it really helped me not fear it as much. So that's one. Two, then there's all these phenomena that can happen as well, where people are seeing dead people, they're smiling when they die. Um, uh, so many things we can get into, but then that also has helped me feel like, wow, this is, this is pretty crazy. This is wild. Um, so all of it together has really made me, um, not, I mean, I'm not afraid to die. I never really was, but I'm really not afraid to die now. I still don't want to, I still want to live a long, happy life, but I believe in my body and I know it will take care of me. And it really helps me live today. Like uh, watching people die and understanding death has helped me live better, which I think will help me die better. Mm. So f firstly, when you say about our bodies are built to help us die, can you tell us more about that? Yes. It's one of my favorite topics. So I think a lot of people listening might... Um, not think that. And there are certain diseases that will cause certain symptoms that make it seem like death is painful. Really, diseases that we die from can be painful and hard to manage. So that's one thing. Um, but if we can manage those symptoms, our bodies have built in mechanisms to help our bodies shut down. So if the body starts clicking into like, hey, I think we're dying, <laughs> I, I think, I, not I think, our bodies know. So like, this is happening, we're going to start shutting down now. Most everyone who's getting close to death will stop eating and drinking. And that's because our bodies know what's going on. And our bodies know that we don't really need fuel and, and hydration anymore. And in fact, too much of it will make it worse. So they make, our body makes us less hungry and less thirsty. Our calcium level, our calcium levels usually rise and then that makes us sleep all the time. So if you ever know, if you ever seen someone um dying, if if it's this gradual slow death that sometimes death is, um I'm not talking about someone if they were like hit by a car or something different, okay? That's a different thing. But if they're doing this natural process, They'll always sleep more. They'll always eat and drink less. That's helping the body die. Then mm -hmm. towards the very, very end, metabolic changes are happening. Physiological changes are happening. And, the, and because we're not eating and drinking, our body goes into something called ketosis. And ketosis releases endorphins that dulls pain. And actually can make us feel euphoric. It makes us feel good. It releases chemicals to make us feel good. Um, and that's just to name a few. And, and a lot of this stuff, we don't, we don't know everything the body does because we're not really studying a dying body very much. But the things we do know show that our body actually helps us shut down and helps us have a, um, a better experience. Mm. So to, to come on to the phenomena um, side of things and what, because I've heard about this before, before. Do you know what? Actually, I can't remember, Julie, whether I heard about it before, or whether I heard about it because of you. And then that's how <laughs> I but I've definitely heard of it. T tell us more about that, because I find that fascinating. And I guess to follow on from that, how has that shaped your worldview on what your belief system is? So personally, I've always been like, I've always been a seeker. I never have ever thought like, I for sure know the answer of what happens after death. But even as a little girl, I would ask my mom questions about like, what is it going to be like to die? And why do we die? Why are we here? You know, what's the purpose of life? That's like a four year old, my poor mom. So I've always kind of had that in me. But being a hospice nurse, and still being of, you know, I, I love science. I love biology. I loved nursing school. And like learning about like um, um, all of the scientific things that we learn. Um, so it was hard for me to believe when I got these little packets that we were giving our hospice patients and their families in the packets, the educational packets would actually say stuff like your family member may start seeing the unseen, seeing dead relatives. These were things we were educating people about in like our educational mm. packets. And I thought, what the hell? <laughs> I can't believe I've, I've almost felt embarrassed. Like we can't say these things. 
this is this is a hallucination. This is something. This is we're probably they're drugged up or something. I just didn't. I couldn't believe it for myself until I started seeing it. And and you see it so often. And it's not just so one of the one of the bedside phenomena is visioning. It's probably the second most common one we see mm-hmm. where people start seeing dead relatives or dead pets or you know old friends that had died or children that had died. Um, so that's one of the things, the first thing we, the the number one thing we see is, uh, terminal lucidity, which is when people have a burst of energy before they die. Um, anyway, so my whole point is I was very skeptical at first, but then you see it all the time and you see how, um, how real it is. I mean, most people think, oh, it's because they're on so many medications or it's because they're not, they don't have oxygen. They don't have enough oxygen. That is not what's happening. One, I am a nurse. I know what that looks like. I know what like delirium looks like. I know what agitational, like terminal agitation looks like, or if someone's over medicated, it's not like that. They are like mostly lucid and mm. not on medications and talking like you, you and I are, except they're being like, I'm just as surprised as you are. But my dad's over there smiling at me and telling me that he's coming to get me soon and not to worry. You know what I mean? It's just like, what? And that happens so often that it's hard not to, you know, what, I mean, what else is it? I mean, even if it is purely something their brain is doing, that's amazing. Thank you, brain, for taking care Mm. of us and making us feel comfortable at the end of life. I agree. Yeah. Um, How do you... Because I I struggle to even imagine what it must be like to be in that situation as a patient. How do you support and comfort someone who is, you know, in a hospice, scared of dying of what their eventual fate is? What, What do you do to support that person? I think anyone listening, anyone can do this. So this is what I do. I think it's so important that we all get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think none of us want to feel uncomfortable or have anyone we love have bad feelings or feel uncomfortable. So we try to make them not uncomfortable or make us not uncomfortable. And I think that we do, we do each other, both of us, a disservice because there's not a real connection there because we're not, we're not saying the truth. And the truth is I'm scared. And the person who's dying may be scared. And I, so what I try to do is be a person who is clearly not uncomfortable with them being uncomfortable. And I just do that by being there, um, asking hard questions, um, or not even asking hard questions, right? I I can just be there. I can just show up. And if they start, um, many, many people, uh, will just openly say stuff like, I don't want to die or I'm afraid to die. And if they do say that, I always say um, how normal they are. You know, it's so normal. And you're already a step ahead of most people because you're even able to verbalize that. Most people won't even verbalize that. And the fact Mm. that you're able to say those scary words and acknowledge how you feel, you're already a step ahead of most people. And that's kind of all you really need to do. And then mm-hmm. all the person needs to do is listen to them say that. And they can even respond honestly, like, me too. I don't want mm-hmm. you to die. I'm afraid too. I'm sad. And then there's a real connection there. And that has happened to me so many times with patients where there's a real connection and there's something about the connection that makes it comforting and makes you feel better, which is ultimately what we're trying to do anyway. <laughs> Right. Do you think this is your life now? Do you do you think that you would ever not work in a hospice? No, I don't think. I don't. I think I always will, even if it's not. Even if it's not all the time, because nursing in general is hard. No matter how much you love it, it's just hard to do <laughs> all the time. Yes. So uh, I would definitely do it less. But I still, I really love it. I really, really love it. And I can say this: if any nurses are listening to this, and they are unhappy with the kind of nursing they're doing. Do a different kind of nursing. Because when I was an ICU nurse, I felt like I've made the wrong choice. I'm just not meant to be a nurse. This just must, this just must not be for me. Like it didn't dawn on me that maybe I was in the wrong kind of nursing. 
Um, mm, thankfully, I, I switched, you know, thankfully I switched and, and now, um, and I've also made some things so nursing works for me versus, versus me working for like the man. Like, I feel like I've done things so I can still really enjoy nursing. Um, cause you I, need time. Yeah. I, I guess being around death so much, you must have given thought to your own death at some point. Um, and you know, how you might sort of leave this planet that we're on. Have you kind of given thought to, would you want this sort of the hospice journey where it's longer and drawn out, but you know, it's coming and it's slower um or would you you know want to go it, it, in in an instant and it just be over what 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 how do you feel about it so one i think anyone who's working in this kind of like death care if you want to call it that i think anyone working in death care should have already thought about this stuff like i think it's something you kind of have to go through and think about and and feel comfortable with to some extent so you can be good at your job and not because it's uh yeah so that's one so yes i have and i think anyone who works in this area should also do that because i think uh it can get muddy if you don't and like you don't know mm. where your emotions are and their emotions are and i think that's why some people think oh my gosh it must be so hard it must be so sad it must be and it's like um it is it can be sad and hard but because i've kind of done work around that I don't get like muddled into someone else's journey. That makes sense. I have yeah, that like does. the boundaries are the boundaries are there. So I'm not like in it. I'm there just to support. Anyway. Yes, I have. And, and uh, I would like to, I think I would like to uh, die a, <clears throat> a slower death, even though people think that sounds awful. That's what people need to understand. If your symptoms are well managed, Dying this like slow progressive death doesn't have to be this like horrendous thing that people think it is. Um, it takes a lot of flexibility because you have to be comfortable with change because your body's going to change and your functional status is going to change. And that's hard when you're used mm. to being independent. But I'd like that because I'd want to prepare for it. I want my family to be prepared for it and I want to prepare for it. So I would like that more. But if I did just suddenly get in an accident and I, and I died, uh, I'm okay with that. And I've said all of the things I needed to say to all of my family members. So they know I'll be okay. They um, know I love them. They know where all of my passwords to all my things are. Um, Cause I, I, even though I'm 41, I've still prepared for end of life. You know, my sister is the one in charge of all of my stuff. So if anything happens to me, she knows where to find um, things she needs to find to kind of take care of stuff. And go ahead. Sorry. Oh, this, I, I've just got so many questions for you, yeah. Julie. I'm si sitting on the edge of my seat here. Um, obviously, we, we kind of, when someone's on, you know, their uh, uh, deathbed, I guess is what, one way to put it. Um, I'm guessing people very rarely, um, sort of when they, they come to, What's the way? How do I want to put this? When people are coming to dine, they obviously start looking back at their life, and and I'm guessing no one sits there and goes, "Oh, I wish I'd worked harder. I wish I'd done more chores in my life." You know, but there's obviously going to be common themes of what people, you know, when they're in those final moments of life, the reflections they have. Can you share some of the um, kind of things that you hear patients saying? But perhaps, you know, they they wish they'd done more of um, because I think, you know, a lot of the time in this life we get tied up in ego. Um, you know, we don't always do what we want to do because we're scared of judgment. Um, and I want to see what lessons can we learn from people who, um, you know, have got to the end of the life and they're reflecting back on their life. Exactly. The biggest one, the biggest take home for me is them taking for granted all the little things taking like taking for granted their health taking for granted the fact that they could leave their house go drive and get groceries buy groceries make a meal eat the meal feel good after the meal um go to bed easily sleep all night like there's when your health is taken away 
And although, like I said, our, your bodies take care of us, you know, we, we can do things to help with all the symptoms that come along with illness, but you still aren't the same. It's still, it's still different. It's still such a, a, a lot more work. And people mm. always talk about how like they wish they would have appreciated the fact that they had strong legs that could go for like a long walk up a hill. And I would, I always be like, damn, that's right. Like I take for granted that I wake up every day, usually feeling pretty good. Like, and I can go about my day and do what I want. So because we live in a, in a capitalistic society where like, you have to keep working. You have, cause of course people say, you know, I wish I would have taken the vacation. I wish I wouldn't have worked so much. I wish I would have seen my family more. They do still say those things. And I realized talking to a person who's still living in the kind of like everyday move, 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 we got to keep this, our life going. It's really hard to say, you should think more about not working so hard and going on vacation because you need money to do that and you need a job to have money. So how do you do the things, right? So I think it's really important to remember that if you're in that life cycle where you feel like you have to keep going, keep going, keep going, how can we reframe our life so we uh, appreciate and acknowledge and feel grateful for those everyday things that actually are pretty amazing? Mm. Like feeling sunshine, seeing a flower, having fresh water, being able to feel good in our bodies. Things so like it really that. is the little things, isn't it? It's yeah. Um, and I think we can all be guilty of that. I try and live in a life of gratitude where I'm really grateful for health. Well, actually says on my fridge um, in handwriting, the gift of health is keeping me alive. So every day when I go in the fridge, I look at that because um, but I think it's only because maybe I talk about death a lot just on this podcast of the spirit world or whatever. So I'm very aware of how grateful I have to be for my health. Yeah. But why do you think we have such a hard time talking about death when it happens to us all? Well, what I think, you know, like in the 1800s, which was not that long ago, um, people were dying in their homes. Death was not a thing that we you know, because of the, because of our medical advances, which is great. People are living longer. People are going to hospitals, having access to that easier. So, uh, back in the day, that wasn't the case. So people w would get sick. They might have a doctor come visit them or they'd go to like the infirmary or something, but eventually they'd come home and they'd be dying at home and their family would be caring for them. Kids would be there. They would have the funeral in the home. The family would be taking care of it all. So I think it was a little more in our faces then. Yeah. Um, not that I would, I wasn't alive then, but that's what I'm told anyway. <laughs> and there's pictures and like, there's a really cool history about it. I love learning about it. And then slowly, but surely it was kind of like taken out of the home and made into this like emergency thing. And then we just stopped. So now we don't see it really. We don't see it until we do. Right. And then when we do, yeah. we're like, what the hell is this? You know, most of the things I hear from people are my loved ones suffered. And then they, t they tell me how and why, and they explain the actively dying process, which happens to m almost all people, especially if they're dying on hospice. And they don't realize that that's actually not suffering. That's actually metabolic things happening in the body, physiological things that are happening in the body. And the person's probably fine. They just don't know what death looks like. So it scares the shit out of them and they are afraid mm. and they think their loved one suffered. Um, and then because that's so scary, then they really don't want to talk about it either. Right. So it's just this, like over the years, I think it's been so removed from us and it's the ultimate unknown and anything unknown is scary. So people don't want to talk about it. Well, you're right as well, because I think that you make a really good point because back in those days of the 1800s, you'd be very close to it and people would be dying all around you. And now it is, it is shut behind closed doors unless you go into a hospital or a, um, you, I think a sobering reminder sometimes is maybe when you see a funeral, um, you know, procession or a car, but it's very rare that, you know, well, actually I do live just up the road from a crematorium, so not that rare for me, but for a lot of people it can be. Um, I want to ask because a lot of people, uh, I think one thing that really caught me out and was difficult was when my granddad um, passed away about 10 years ago. 
I knew nothing about hospice and we absolutely got launched into this world and it was all really, it was really stressful and sad because we didn't know what to do. We didn't know any questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'd never come into contact with a hospice and even to get him into one was really um, difficult and hard. So um, I want to sort of navigate some, you know, things that people should be aware of, um, you know, when considering a hospice because I wish I had this information I, uh, at the time and I guess you know what should people be aware of if they've got a loved one in this position yeah so I do think like the actual system of hospice is probably different because you're where are you where are you located you're in you're England. In London? England yeah so yeah. it's probably a little different England versus the U.S. so I've heard but generally speaking I think um what what I can focus on is what can you expect if someone's like end of life in in a hospice either in England or or in America or Canada or wherever you are. At the end of life, what you can expect is um it to feel hard. That's another thing. You know, like I we're not we don't like to feel bad things. And I think we live in a world where it's like, don't feel bad at all costs. And I think knowing that you're not doing something wrong because it feels so hard. I think the healthcare system everywhere, America, I could go on and on. That's a soapbox I could get on. Our healthcare system <laughs> is jacked and we, and, and, and it's just hard to navigate through. So like, if you're feeling like this is so hard, how are people doing this? It's like, yeah, no, it's just hard. I'm not saying that's right. I don't really have an answer for it because I'm just one person, but just know that like, you're not losing your mind. It's really hard. And um, there are, and just keep asking questions, keep being an advocate, keep making sure your loved one is clean, safe, and comfortable. That's another thing too, is people start being like, I should do more. I should do more. This feels so weird. We're just like letting them lay here and die. Um, is what it feels like, I think. And it's like, um, kind of, and ask yourself, are they clean? Are they safe? Are they comfortable? And if you can say yes to all of those things, that is, you did a good job and their bodies need to do what it needs to do. So clean, safe, comfortable, clean, safe, comfortable, and know that when someone is getting towards the end of their life, again, let their body be the guide. If they want to sleep 24 hours a day, let them sleep as long as they are clean, right? If they don't want to eat and drink, don't make them eat and drink. You can offer them food and water, see if they want anything. If they do, great. If they don't, that's okay. Because again, our bodies are preparing them, themselves. Mm. Um, know that during the actively dying phase, which is the last phase of life, your loved one is going to look different. They are going yeah. to be mostly, yeah, they're going, they're not going to look like themselves. They're going to be mostly unconscious, meaning like they're not going to wake up if you're like grabbing their hand or doing something. They're going to be mostly unconscious, which is okay. Um, their eyes and mouth might be open because at this time, all of the muscles are relaxing and our bodies, it takes muscles to shut our mouth. It takes muscles to shut our eyes, to blink our eyes, to move. So all these muscles, they're relaxing. So people will have like, they'll almost look a little gaunt sometimes because their mouths might be open. Their muscles are relaxing fully so they can look just a little strange. Their coloring might be off. Their breathing's definitely going to be different if it's at very end of life. So they're going to breathe differently. They might have a little gurgling noise. Also, people always think they're like drowning on fluids or it's something awful. And really, it's usually just a little bit of secretions in their mouth and uh, their breath's going over it. So it's making this sound and it freaks people out. I say all this stuff because I want to try to normalize what actual death looks like. Because in the movies, mm. someone looks perfectly fine. They say some beautiful monologue and then they close their eyes and they die. <laughs> and it's like, well, it's not like that. It's, that's not when how I, it you, happens. Yeah. When I saw my nan in, in the hospice, I, I really struggled because she didn't look anything like she did normally. Yeah. And that was really hard to to see um, because yeah. she just didn't look like the same person then it really shocked me actually yeah um and I just knew at that point and it was also quite bizarre as well because I knew because I was visitor visiting her in the hospice a lot but I knew when it was the last time I just knew I had this gut feeling that this is the last time I'm ever gonna 
um, sort of see her. Um, I want to come on to your book because I think it's a beautiful book, um, Demystifying Death, um, To Live More Fully, Nothing to Fear. Um, and the book talks about a lot of different points, but it talks... I want to bring up a couple of points from the book which sort of jumped out at me um, to sort of go into. Um, I guess, firstly, what what made you write this book? Well, I think just to have... um, It's kind of like a handbook to me. Uh, It's meant for people who don't want to watch videos or who want more information. Like, I want people... I want this to be what I would love. Will this happen? I don't know. But I want this to be like in everyone's home <laughs> because it's a handbook to, to, you don't have to read it from cover to cover. I mean, you can, it's, it's, but, but if you just want to know one little thing, or if you see something and you're like, what's that mean? Or how do I do this? You can look at the chapters and go to that chapter and just read that chapter. So it's just meant to be like a learning tool, a guide, Um, And then, of course, with like stories woven in, so it doesn't feel like a textbook. (laughs) It can also feel entertaining if you want it to. Um, So that's why it's like not everyone wants to, not everyone's on social media. Not everyone wants to ingest video. People want to read. Um, Not everybody, including me. I'm not much of a reader, really, but, but. A lot of people are, Do you know so. what? I, I aspire to be a better reader. Me I too. wish I was. Um, as you can tell, I've got loads of books behind me, but they're all in the queue waiting to be read. Uh. Same, 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 <laughs> same. I have bookshelves. I have every all these books on audio. But every year I'm like, I'm going to read more. And every yeah, year I that's don't. what I do. Yeah. In the book, you tell readers, um, we die the way we lived. Um, and be intentional about both. Can you tell us a bit more about that sentiment and what, and what you mean by that? Yeah. I feel like I was able to write that because of all the people I've seen die the way they live. And I feel like people who were, and this is no, this is no like shade to those people, but people who were unwilling to be flexible unwilling to make change, unwilling to ask for help. People who, um, and I say this talking to myself, the people who are like neurotic during their life, right? Or if, if you're really like anxious and wound up all during your whole, like during your lifetime, you're not going to just suddenly not be that way when you're dying. <laughs> and mm. that can make for a rough one because you have to let go a little bit when you're in that phase. And I only know that because I see it all the time. And the people who are willing to let go a little bit, ask for help, be flexible, um, uh, accept change, seemed to die better. And I feel like the people who were willing and able to do that lived that way as well. Um, so I saw that personality really played into end of life. Um, and outlook really plays into end of life. So listen to that and see how you're living right now. You know, like, are you, uh, are you living this like tight controlled, like unwilling to like be open to anything type of life? I feel like it's, it, it, that will be reflective in your death. That will be. Mm. And that's not like a threat. It's just more, I mean, I'm saying this to myself. I'm not the most flexible, good with change type of person. Uh, you know, I say it to to remind me too. It's like the people, not everyone who's his dying is old at all, but people who I have seen some elderly people who are, you know, they have the money, but they're unwilling to pay for help. Right. And then because right. of that, because of that, they suffer. Because of that, they have a fall. Because of that, they don't get the the hygiene they need or the food they need or because they are unwilling to change. They are unwilling. Uh, they're kind of like forced into it eventually because then they're unsafe. Um, so it's just things like that. It'll be so much easier for you if you could just let go a little bit, a little bit. Be... It ahead. sounds like... It's, it sounds like all of the, uh, you know, your experiences in your career really shape the way that you live your life. And it must do, because to be reminded of that 
every day and to be so close to death must make you live your life more fully, surely. Yeah. Yeah. It does. I feel grateful for it. That's why that's why my job isn't actually depressing. I feel I feel like it's an honor. It's an honor. It's a it's a big reminder. Um, like I said, half the stuff that I'm writing in the book, I'm telling to myself. Because I see it reflecting in me. I see Well, it, it shouldn't just be a book that I don't think it should be a book that people only read when they've got a loved one in that situation. I think that exactly. it's a book that should be read um to prepare. One exactly. of the points uh, and um Something that's mentioned in the book is the most important conversations to have before we die. Um, can you give us a flavour uh, of, you know, what you feel that we should, conversations we should be having? Yes. And th- these conversations, if you're listening, anyone who's listening, these conversations should be had now. Not when you're, not when you're dying. Now. Mm, so I right. think people need to, people, you need to tell people what you'd want in certain events. And then this is where people are like, no, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. But like, if, if I'm in an accident and I am brain dead, or even if I'm not brain dead, they think I am or whatever, right? How long should I, how long do you want to be on machines? If you are on machines, do you want, you know, uh, do you want a feeding tube? Do you want to be intimate? There's certain things in the book. It goes into detail about different machines and like what you'd want, but detail, I'm talking detail because if you want to take care of your family, think about it this way. If you don't want to talk about it for yourself, talk about it for your family, because that will help them so much. If God forbid, but if if something happens, they will already know because you guys already talked about it. You know, mm. what do you want done if this happens? What do you want done if this happens? And this and your and your answers may change um, over the, you know, over, over time. Right. So like, right. I have all of this filled out. My family knows, but I'm 41. So I kind of want a lot of things done, but if I'm 85 and kind of ill with a bunch of things, then it's going to change. So you want to change, you want, you want over time, you want to change whatever it is you want. Right. Also go over, do you want to be buried? Do you want to be cremated? Do you want a funeral? Do you not want a funeral? Do you not care? Do you uh, want to write your obituary? Like if I got a terminal illness tomorrow, I want a living funeral. I want to be at my own funeral and I want everyone to tell me how wonderful I am and me tell me how wonderful they are. You know, so it's things. I think that's what we all want, Julie. We all want that. (laughs) You know, uh, we can, you, you, we can get as detailed as, as like, I always say, if I am in my actively dying era and I am actively dying, I want the office, the American office, no offense, playing in the background. I don't need like harp music. I want like a funny show. Yeah, you, you don't want to be watching something that's going to be sad. Do you need something that's going to uplift you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it can be, it doesn't have to be all sad. It can be funny too. It can be details like that you know, about what you would want if you were um, unconscious and your family was caring for you. What how, Would you want the lights on, lights off, people having fun around you, the office? Um, and it's just, it's true. I think, I think it can be like a dinner party. Everyone talk about what they want. It shouldn't be something that is like so taboo, like you said. We should just well, hopefully talking. we we will start to move more in that direction yeah. and i think that you know having conversations like this is kind of hopefully what um you know i, I now know that i need to have that conversation because um not that i'm now uncomfortable i'm not uncomfortable with death now i accept death and i am willing to talk about it but saying that i still haven't had the conversation that you're saying i should have oh. about it so um you know even i, I need to do that um, I want to ask you, one of the topics in the book um, that you discuss as well is around uh, the importance of language surrounding death and dying. Um, obviously, I can understand um, you know, why that's important, but can you elaborate why language matters in this context and how it can influence um, the end of life experience for someone? Yeah, I think we just, again, it's going to take time. And I get the whole sugar, or, uh, you know, making it sound a little nicer. They passed away. They're gone. Passed away is the big thing. We all say they passed away. They passed away. And there's nothing wrong with that. I do understand how it 
might feel a little better. But I think we need to start moving in the direction of not acting like saying so-and-so died, so-and-so is dead, so-and-so is dying. Um, because, like even me, I, I say that I am the one writing this and saying this, and I still get how that can kind of sting a little or a lot, mm. really. But I think we need to start moving in the direction of like, that's not a dirty word. Saying someone's dead is sad, but it's not bad. It's inevitable. It, that's what, and, and death doesn't have to be a dirty word. Dying, death, dead. We can start getting used to saying those things. And I think it's a matter of practice because we've been taught for so long that that is a bad word. And that is, that creates so much emotion and fear. And that's what I'm trying to change. And I think, not me, so many people, not, ju not just me, but um, that's what we people in this movement are trying to change, that those aren't bad words and, those, and we can say those words. And it's important that we do because the more we do, the more comfortable we become with the idea that that's eventually going to happen because mm. I think it's important we all get comfortable with that. Yeah, I agree. And what advice would you give to someone who is facing the prospect of losing a loved one or navigating their own end of life journey um, to anyone who might be listening now, might be experiencing that. Yeah. Oh, there's so much. I think um, the first thing would just be uh, if like it, having them understand that it's okay that they're probably afraid and scared and sad and angry. I always say that like, I'm not, I'm not really afraid to die, but if I, again, if I got diagnosed with something terminal tomorrow or my sister did, or my mom did, I would still have all of the human emotions of feeling anger and sadness and fear. Um, so they're normal for feeling that way. And to ask questions, ask questions. I get so many questions from people on my social media platforms, which is great. I but bet all you those, do. I bet, I bet it's very all busy. All questions, <laughs> I want to be like, ask your healthcare provider. Don't ask a nurse on the internet, you know, ask yeah. your healthcare provider. So don't be afraid to ask all of the questions and keep asking questions until you've, until, until forever, always ask the questions. So I would say the best thing you can do is understand that you're normal for having all of the feelings and feeling uncomfortable and feeling like it's so hard and scary and that's normal. You're not doing anything wrong. And talk to your doctor openly about death and dying uh, because that's going to give your, your doctor the, the, the open window of, hey, look how comfortable I am talking about this, even if you're not, <laughs> but you're still doing it. <laughs> So then they can have an open conversation with you because sometimes not everyone's good at that. Not, not all healthcare providers are good at that. So they'll, they'll just give you one window of this is your disease. Here's what we normally do. And that's great. But I want to know all of the paths. What, what else can I do? What can I expect down the road? How long is this going to last? Is, there, is this curable? Is this a life limiting illness? Like ask all the questions. Um, even if it seems scary, just because the more prepared you are, the better you'll live and the more peaceful you'll die. End of story for sure. So prepare. We prepare for everything. We pre prepare for weddings, for births, for jobs. We should all be, be being prepared for death. Do you know what? When you say that, it it is funny because it, it should be normal. But I think it's I think it must come down to the fear of yeah. the unknown. Yeah. Um, and someone once gave me a funny, I you know what, you know, when you come across things and then you can't remember where you came across them from some, someone used an analogy about a baby recently and to a baby in the mother's womb is petrified of birth, you know, yeah, it right. is unknown. And it's, I guess it is the same with death. Um, Julie, I love what you do, and I think your book's so fabulous. Um, yeah. I, I, do you know what? If someone had said I wouldn't have even used the word fabulous next to death um, probably a few years ago, but now I do, and I think it's a great book. Um, if Thank anyone you. wants to find out more about Julie or follow her on her social medias, all the links will be in the show notes along with the book. 
Julie, I just want to say thank you for coming on. It's been so fascinating to just hear, um, just look through the looking glass into what your world looks like. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me the chance. It's been great ch chatting with you. Well, there we go. That was the amazing Julie McFadden. Do remember, you can get involved with the show in a number of ways. You can go over to YouTube, subscribe to my channel, where then you'll be notified when new content comes out. And you can also comment on my videos. I really like reading the comments, and it always uh, does blow my mind when I hear how many of you are having the same challenges or um, you're learning the same lessons along your path in your spiritual development. You can also get involved with the show by emailing us. Uh, the email address is in the show notes. And... Um, all that leaves me to say is I hope you have a lovely week, lots of love, and until next time, a massive goodbye.